This is Film Talk, where we interview the brightest minds in filmmaking five days a week. Do you need a great camera for your next shoot? You may want to consider the world's lightest handheld Super 35 digital film camera, Blackmagic's Ursa Mini 4.6K. The Ursa Mini boasts a 4.6K sensor, global shutter, and up to 15 stops of dynamic range. It's perfectly balanced for handheld use and comfortable enough to be used all day long. Scene one, take one. Film Talk Nation, we are greenlit for yet another great show. Vanessa Frank here, and I'm excited to bring you our featured guest today, John Debney. John, are you ready for your close-up? I am, Vanessa. <laughs> Oscar-nominated and Emmy Award-winning John Debney is considered one of the most prolific and successful composers in Hollywood. His unique ability to create memorable work across a variety of genres, as well as his reputation for being remarkably collaborative, have made him the choice of many top producers and directors. His work as a composer includes films like Iron Man 2, The Stoning of Sarah M, Bruce Almighty, Evan Almighty, Sin City, The Passion of the Christ, Elf, Spy Kids, The Emperor's New Groove, and the upcoming film, The Young Messiah. John, it's an honor to have you on the show today. Thank you, Vanessa. It's an honor to be with you today, too. So, John, I would love it if you would start by telling us a little bit of how you first got into this very unique line of work. Sure. Um, I started playing the guitar really when I was about six and you know as a child I practiced and uh, my parents sort of made me practice as you can imagine <laughs> and I just fell in love with music at a very yeah. early age so I started to study the guitar <clears throat> excuse me started studying the piano and started to play in bands when I was a little older and then when I got into college uh, studied music and got my degree in music composition out of college, I started freelancing for a number of people that were doing uh, television back in the day, and used to, <clears throat> excuse me, orchestrate for a lot of guys that were very prolific at that time. Mm -hmm. And I sort of have now made my way uh, slowly but surely through the ranks of doing television, and then pretty soon I got a chance to start doing films, mm -hmm. and there you go. And then it's been like a, a journey up the ladder since, yeah. since that time. So I was really fascinated uh, to learn that you had composed a lot of the music for uh, Spy Kids 1 and 2, knowing as I do that Robert Rodriguez is in his own right um, an accomplished composer. He composes yeah. the music for a lot of his movies. And so I know that you have a reputation for being very collaborative, I'd love it if you could give us a little bit of an insight as to how you um, fray a path through working with directors like Robert Rodriguez, who have a very, very clear idea of what they want. Um, and in many cases, you know, someone li like himself is, is very accomplished in his own right. How do you work through that process of bringing to the table your vision while at the same time retaining the integrity of what the director is looking for? Well, that, that's a great question. Uh, I, I would say this, that in the case of my friend Robert, um, he is a very good composer and a very good musician. Yeah. We've done a number of films together. I think Spy Kids was the first. And we have such a kind of kinship and friendship. We're both mm. guitar players that we immediately sort of gravitated towards um, sitting with each of us with a guitar, talking about music, and we organically sort of came to a great uh, working relationship rather quickly. Um, that's very unique. With other directors that aren't necessarily musicians, it's, it's always a trial and error. Uh, you, you sort of have a lot of chats about initial discussions with directors about their, their likes and dislikes in music and what types of music they like. And then slowly but surely, you sort of glean what it is they're looking for. And then it becomes 
really then my job to try to interpret their their vision yeah. in, into music. And that's really what I do. Yeah. And you do it so incredibly well. Um, in my opinion, one of your most beautiful pieces is the, the Passion of the Christ. It's uh, it absolutely um, just, gosh, I, I really struggle for words to even um, convey just the amplitude of, of visceral emotions that um, I feel that movie uh, stirs up in in anyone who holds dear that that um, that scriptural story of um, the journey of, of Jesus Christ. And right. I would imagine that the weight <laughs> of of trying to depict a story like that through the music must be immense. I mean, do you feel when you're dealing with a subject that is so sacrosanct to so many people, did you, do you kind of feel that weight upon yourself or I mean how, how does yeah. it how does it feel to kind of to work on a project like that well that's such a great question the answer is yes uh, yeah. especially on that one you know I, but I would say that a lot of films um, that I think that that I hold that, that I've done that I've worked on that I hold dearly I feel that way about uh, the passion definitely being at the top of the list mm -hmm. it was a very very arduous yet beautiful journey with uh, Mel on that film. Um, but it was it was the hardest thing I've ever done, that's yeah. for sure. Because you can imagine, Vanessa, um, with with those visuals and with the subject yeah. matter, you, re you really want to, I wanted to dig as deeply as I could and really try to pull out every, every little stop that I could, as it were, mm. just to make every moment of that film be exactly right and I must say that Mel was a huge part of that we, we really did that score together mm. um, we would work in the studio almost every two days he'd come in and we'd bring musicians in and then we'd sort of experiment mm. and it was like that and yeah. we ended up with a score weirdly enough and it wasn't planned but we ended up with a score that sort of starts very in a very amorphous sort of way where it's not terribly well defined what what the score is, and then we go through the the journey in that film, and lo and behold, the end of the film becomes very very almost operatic. It becomes very orchestral. Mm. It becomes very emotional. It becomes very stirring. And um, again, I'm just so you know sort of humbled by the whole thing. I, yeah. I, I don't quite still to this day, almost 12 years later, don't really understand it all <laughs> the yeah. why of it but i i do agree with you and, I, and i'm so humbled that people like yourself you know are touched by it and i get a lot of emails and comments from people that they're still touched by it these days and it's very mm. it's humbling and gratifying and all the above i mean i just can't even imagine what it must be like to look at a scene like uh, gethsemane or the crucifixion knowing that the musical direction that you take is going to completely color these scenes for millions of people. True. It's... Very, very difficult. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it, on the surface, it was difficult. And then at other times, it was sort of sublime that, mm. you know, I, I sort of gleaned late in the process that on some of the more difficult areas of that film that, Really, the best thing I could do was to play opposite of what you're seeing. Yeah. And, I, and and I was very lucky that I came to that realization because that truly, I think, worked uh, to great effect. And I know mm. Mel Mel loved it. And I know the listeners always mention a couple of scenes to me that mean a lot to them. And yeah. I think it was in that kind of realization of amidst the sort of difficulty of, of seeing these images, you know, the music has to do something. It has to yeah. either make you feel exactly what's going on, or it has to let you sort of remove yourself a little bit from mm. what you're seeing. And that was a very, it sounds rather esoteric, but that was definitely in Mel's mind that yeah. there were times when we really needed to um, buoy the listener so yes. that they could sort of get through it. And, uh, yes. That, so that's really was, was the intent on, on mm. a lot of that music. 
in, in terms of um, working with pre-existing uh, protagonists in movies, so for example, you've done um, Iron Man 2, so you've, you've got this, um, you're kind of inheriting this, this very well-known character, or now you're doing The Young Messiah, and previously you did Passion of the Christ, so obviously though that's two very different points of that character's life, it's, it's still yeah. the same character. Do you find that that kind of um, seeps into your work, that kind of thought of, of how the audience has, has maybe previously had that character be depicted to them through the music, or, is that, or do you really just start with a blank slate? Well, a great question. Um, really, in the case of Iron Man, uh, because there have been three films and three different composers, it was kind of easy for me to just sort of divorce myself from the first film. Yeah. And, you know, I'm working right now with the same director, John Favreau and Jungle Book. And he's amazing. He's like, have, he's sorry, I'm such a fan so girl great. when it comes to him. <laughs> oh, he's, he's like, if he's I was having man. a dinner party, I actually probably like that the two, two of the people I'd most want to have there would be John Favreau and Robert Rodriguez. So I, you have to know I'm very uh, envious of you. <laughs> well, great. Well, I, I, I can tell you they, they would both love that and they're both <laughs> very gracious and charming yeah. guys. So I think yeah. that it would be a great evening. It would. <laughs> um, in the in the case of John Favreau, you know, with Iron Man two, really he he gave me the carte blanche just to create what I wanted to create, um, yet knowing that there is sort of a palette. There's a musical palette yeah. and a soundscape for Iron Man that I really had to honor. You know, there's the mm -hmm. That rock and roll sensibility with the, with the electric guitars and sometimes the big drums, and that was fun for me. So mm -hmm. um, I got to really let sort of do my own thing on that one. With the passion and the young Messiah, interestingly enough, they're very much obviously related, as you said, because yeah. they're the same character. So it also they share in common musical um, identity. They share. Some very, I'm hoping for those in the know that there'll be some interesting, almost related themes between mm. them, uh, and which is, by the way, always fun for a composer to revisit an earlier work, yeah. and, <laughs> you know, and and kind of repaint the painting mm. and yet have hints and colors that one would remember from from another work. So uh, when when in approaching Young Messiah, I really did want to sort of hint at other themes and also um, yet imbue it with its own identity and yeah. its own new themes. So, mm. yes, you, you have to sort of, in my opinion, honor what, what has gone, What's before, gone before and yeah. yet, yet try to do it your own way. Yeah. And in terms of um, the moments, I, I mean, are there moments in these in these movies where you actively look at the footage or look at what's being cut and you say it's really important that there's no music here i mean how do you how do you discern when the moments are when the footage just needs to stand on its own and and not have music kind of you know buoy it as as you were saying earlier i i honestly another very perceptive question i for one, and I don't know if, if other composers feel this way, I'm very, very um, cognizant of, of music that intrudes on the narrative and yeah. on, on the visuals. And I, I don't have an ego with, at least I hope I don't. <laughs> um, I many times, and it's embarrassing to say this, but many times when I go to a dub where we're putting all the you know, final pieces of a film together, all the sound, Many times I'll, I'll suggest, you know, can we lower this piece of music here or yeah. might, we, might we get it out of the music here? And I, I'd say a good percentage of the time the director will kind of, you know, either say yay or nay, nay based, but mm. it, there is a discussion that goes on for sure. Yeah. And I'm more bumped, honestly, I'm more bumped by, in general, by music that is too loud in a film. Yes. Or tries tries to say too much all the time. Mm. So yeah. I, I try to edit my own work like that. And, and, you know, it's just sort of I'm very 
aware, at least I, I try to be as aware as I can of, you know, what I'm trying to say and is it too much or is it too mm. little? Yeah, I think there's such a wisdom to that because we've definitely all seen movies where it's like the music just drowns out the action yeah. and, and it can yeah. get to a point where it just feels uh, cognitively, it just feels too much. Um, mm -hmm. So, John, True. you have had, uh, by anyone's esteem, you've had an incredibly successful career and you continue to have an incredibly successful career got some really exciting movies coming out in the next few months as, as you mentioned earlier in terms of um your past and kind of where you've come from what is the biggest challenge you've encountered so far in your career and how did you turn that situation around oh the biggest challenge yeah that's, that's a wonderful question um i you know we're all different as human beings i think my own personal challenge has been literally the the um which we which happens a lot in hollywood the rejection the process yeah. mm. um you know it's so I, I feel for young composers and i so much i mean i try to go do classes when i can i think there's a there's a mentality a mental aspect to what we do and i'm sure it's true with actors and mm. writers and directors I and mean, we all have egos i think one of the biggest challenges for me has been the idea that, you know, I as composer person might think this piece of music I've written is just the most brilliant thing of all time. But, you know, sometimes people don't feel that way. <laughs> they yeah. don't feel the same way. So I think the challenge has been for me, and it's just me talking, one of the biggest things has been to develop quite a thick skin and yeah. let let the criticism kind of wash over me and and I I have been really lucky because I always know my my own rule for myself is let's say I've written something that hasn't you know made the director you know <laughs> jump up and down I, I I always do my little mantra of like okay let me sleep on it and then yeah. sure enough when I get up the next morning I there's always another way to do it and yeah I'm lucky because I can kind of, I think, I've kind of trained myself to to be that way mm. and just kind of leave it leave it at the door when I need to. And um, it served me well. But that I would say that's one of the most challenging things because, you know, probably with, with you also, for all of us, there's so many, you know, impediments to success that those that I think just stick it, stick with it mm. no matter what yeah they do seem to succeed and mm. you know as many times as you're going to falter um i would say that's one of the biggest that may sound very simplistic but a lot of people can't handle that yeah and um, yeah. i always tell young composers just don't fall in love with, with what you've written mm. it, you know you're not beethoven and uh <laughs> And they always, they always sort of give me a funny look when I say that, but it's really true. Yeah. But none, none of us are. I think and, what's I think what's no. really difficult sometimes, speaking from a director's point of view, is that you can objectively see that a piece of music is good, but it's just not the right fit for what right. the emotion that you're wanting to conjure up as a director and that's what I've personally found quite difficult in the past, you know, in, in working with, with, with a composer is to, to help them to understand, listen, I'm not saying that this piece of music is, is bad. It's just not the right fit for what I'm that, trying to do at yeah. this point in time. And I think, unfortunately, there's a lot of, of uh, more novice composers that can really struggle with making the difference between those two statements. You are well. You put it very well, by the way. Because if a director said that to me, I would be overjoyed. Really? <laughs> um, you, you, no, truly, you've ex expressed it really well. Yeah. It, it can be a. It literally can be a really wonderful piece of music, but if it just isn't right for a scene, you know. And we miss mm. composers miss and actors miss sometimes if we don't really know the subtext of of whatever a scene is. Yeah. That's why a great director like your like you. Oh gosh! And, well, <laughs> can, well you, can, you can guide us. You know? Yeah. Um, I gotta say, uh, truly, you mentioned those two gentlemen, and and they're great, uh, Robert and John Favreau. Mm. The case of John Favreau with Jungle Book, 
so much of when I came out of the film was unformed and yes. very, you know, green screens and little stick <laughs> figures. That it's difficult. You can imagine writing music to. Oh gosh, yeah, I hadn't a, even thought about that. Figure. Yeah. Well, that's that's where your that's where the great directors come in. They, yeah. you know, John would guide me through. Okay, you know, I like this piece, but here's what's really going on in the scene. Yeah. And then he can tell me what I'm going to see. You know, six months. Let's say after the does fact. it does it help with him being an actor? Is he? Do you find is he better able to convey the emotion because he's got this incredible skill set of actually being able to portray things, or does that not really make a difference? You know, I I've worked with all kinds. I will say that that it, I think it does help. Yeah. And and I mean, you know, with John and Mel, for instance, and Robert, I think yes. that. Uh, you know, Robert is comes from a musical standpoint, so he can kind of tell me musically mm. what he's feeling like. He doesn't like that chord. He doesn't maybe that note. He's very <laughs> specific, and, and it's really very astute about it all. I'm sure um, he is. He really is. And Mel and John are of the same cloth. Mel literally is, is just visceral like John. He'll, he'll really have to feel it. He'll have to almost, yeah. he'll almost have to act it. And yes, yeah, I could see John that. With or, or Mel, um, they've both done that with me, by the way. They've both, at different times, <laughs> Acted you know, it out. <laughs> yeah, they, they've given me a look or a, yeah. or a, a, you know, like a grimace or a thing. Yeah. And that says so much, and I think that that is helpful. Really well, helpful. I mean, I think it's almost like what you what one is doing is peeling away layers you have to start from somewhere and sometimes yeah. you just have to put something down to realize what you don't want um True. and it can True. take a few iterations to to actually figure out kind of to to go down the list and kind of rule out the options and go no that's not it that's not it that's not it that is it you know um well that that is so true and so. i do that i sometimes you know as a as a composer you know some some days it's hard to come up with a tune mm. or, or or an idea and so i'll do exactly that i'll just start writing and i'll yeah. start putting it down version one version two version three whatever and yeah and and then kind of sleep on it or a few days later kind of relook at stuff and you're right it's whatever ends up sort of sticking to the picture mm. um is what I do, and it sounds like you do the same thing. Well, I just think that a lot of young filmmakers get stuck with this idea of the first time out of the gate that they try something, be it uh, shooting a scene or, or writing a scene or composing a scene. It has to be amazing, and the truth is that I think most of us kind of need to sketch it out and play with it, and when you take that pressure off of yourself of thinking that, oh my gosh, as you said, like this needs to be like Beethoven worthy the first time round, it allows you to just play and have fun with it which I know um having seen some great interviews with Robert Rodriguez I know that's very much his approach of just saying listen like totally. best thing you can do is just take the pressure off of yourself stop being so serious mm -hmm. just play around have fun and that's how the creativity is is going to flow for your work um very true and I think the best directors I would I would add just to what you said best directors are those that don't get freaked out the first time they hear a piece of yeah. music that they don't like. Uh, <laughs> you know, that happens a yeah. lot. And John Favreau, to his great credit, you know, he's such a, a he's such a mature filmmaker now, in my yeah. opinion. And he, you know, there would be many times where I would play him a piece or two and he'd go, well, you know, I'm not in love with it, but that's okay. <laughs> That's okay. So he's and, a diplomat and, as well. <laughs> yeah, which is which is the most liberating thing for a composer. Yeah. It's not like, so you know, you don't feel that pressure of, oh my God, I blew it. Yes. You just you you, you sort of think, ooh, well now, okay, I, yeah. I get what he wants, and then you go back to the drawing board. So you're right. I think that it's sometimes even the way a, a director can communicate, and I think that um, it's very important, you know, to for a director to try to give the composer as much. Uh, emotional sort of uh, feedback as, as mm, they can. Yeah. Um, John, I would love to know, for filmmakers who are working on a smaller budget, I mean, evidently you, for very good reason, are at a stage in your career where you're working on, on large budgets. Um, but I'm wondering, for filmmakers who are um, on a much, much smaller budget and 
if you want to have some form of an orchestral score, um, something that's originally made for that picture that's really going to be tailored to fit um, their, uh, th their work, are there any kind of, I don't want to use the word shortcut because I think that that's kind of misleading, but what would you recommend in terms of, you know, that kind of that expression, like keep it simple, stupid. Like if a, if a director's in a position yeah. where they can't afford a John Debney, they can't afford a whole live orchestra, but they still want to do the best possible job of a soundtrack. What are kind of some of the simple routes through it that, that they can enact that's going to enable them to get quality within the reasonable parameters of what they can actually do? Well, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I, I would first back up just to say that um, I'm, you know, I'm, so lucky that I get to work on. I work on many times very small movies. Really, you and say that now you're going to get inundated from no, I, people I am emailing you. Yes, I'm absolutely the truth <laughs> because you, you and I know that some of the best movies being made are literally m movies being made for two to even less for yes. a million dollars yeah. or something. Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, there's one I looked at just recently that I'm hoping to be involved with that they have very little it maybe like zero money oh wow i love the movie well that that and pitch i'm i want to know what they did to pitch you to do that because they must be masterful in their pitching skills well i, I would say it this way you know it's all in the, in what you see yeah um, the, this particular film without spoiling it is is one that i i see a lot of potential i see potential mm. with the actors um i see potential with the director and plus, I, the director and, and the producers are just really wonderful people. So there's yeah. a lot. I'm, I'm at that kind of enviable place where hopefully I can do one or two big ones a year, and then yes. that, will, that will enable me it to do the smaller for the rest. ones. So, yes. so to answer your question, I, it's a great question. I think that some filmmakers sometimes maybe make a mistake thinking for a smaller film that they really need to somehow – have a big John Williams y type yeah. orchestral score. Mm. Listen, that's all well and good and I love John Williams by the way. But <laughs> um there's so many ways these days to do it. Yeah. And and I think if you're really as a composer and director team, if you're really clever and you're kinda of thinking outside the box, I think there are ways to do it with, you know, a maybe a few live musicians and then yes. and then some synthetic material and maybe some percussion. Mm. Um, I think some of the, to me, some of the more effective scores that I've heard recently are scores that aren't necessarily what you'd yeah. equate, equate like with a big orchestral sound. I think that some of them, even things like Mad Max are just, you know, sure they have a big orchestra, but it's also just a wonderful sound palette. Mm. Um, I think it's just be very, very creative. I think it's, you know, the the advice I would give is just for the director to really, you know, look look for a composer that is really interested in, in writing, ex you know, a great melody for that film mm. or a great motif or it, let, it could even be a sound, you know, yeah. it could even be some kind of weird sound like that you soundscape. create. For, yeah. Exactly. And I think that if you start thinking in those terms, you can get very creative on mm. very little money. Yeah. And, and do something really special. Yeah. Um, I mean, and I, again, it sort of makes you think, you know? Yeah. I had a really interesting conversation recently with uh, Roque Banos. He was telling me how he really feels that there's an evolution going on in terms of film composing, where it did used to be all those very, you know, kind of very, very big orchestral uh, sounds. And that he's perceiving that filmmakers are increasingly moving towards being open to um, being more expressive through the music in the sense of using materials and instruments that wouldn't typically be used for a score. Yeah. So he was saying, for example, True. he composed a score where uh, it was, I think, a horror movie where everything was happening in the basement. And so he was using the sound of objects that you would find in a basement, like, uh, mm -hmm. dra you know, pipes and, sure. and wrenches and things like that. Um, and I, I definitely think that um, in a world 
where it can be really hard to set yourself apart. It can be really hard to um, have your work stand out. I think it's that kind of creativity that for the right project can really give it that extra edge. I agree. Mm -hmm. I, I agree completely with what Roque was saying. He's a great composer, by the he way. He is. He's he a is. Very, very nice man, too. I know, um, right? <laughs> oh, I love him. I love him. I met him years ago in Spain. We're, we're very friendly. You yeah. Know, great guy. Um, I agree with that. I think that, I, you know, it's so funny. I t there are many times where I'll talk to a class, I'll speak to a class of young composers, and they're usually surprised when I say that the, doing a big 100-piece orchestral score for me is easier than doing yeah. like a, a, a sound object, you know, sound mm. designy, you know, weird sounding, cool <laughs> sort of 20th century film score because it's they're both have you know a very uh, specific art mm. to them, but but doing sounds and being clever with it sometimes takes three times as long. Yeah. But I think you're right. I think that the result can be. I'll give you an example of a. I thought a really terrific film score for Looper recently mm. was the. Uh, I forget the chap's name, but really clever sound. You know, found objects. Yeah. And sound and creating rhythms and textures out of just uh, what would you call it? Field recordings, really. Oh I mean, my gosh. It's, it's pretty great. Yeah. So. There's absolutely that, and I think that's a really wonderful way to go, especially for um, a composer that's really trying to break into the business. Yes. I think being as creative, and again, I can't stress that highly enough. You brought up a wonderful topic. I think that sometimes academia or certain areas of young composer land, they think somehow they have to write like a certain person or, yes. you know, I'm the next you know, <laughs> fill in the blank. I'm the next Johnny Williams or J Danny Elfman, what, whatever. <laughs> they don't have to be that, and they really shouldn't be that. They should yeah. be the next, and you know, put their name in there. And whatever mm. that is, um, yeah, they just need to experiment and really work and with a the director themselves. and grow with the director. Yeah. I you know, you want to end up doing five, six, seven, eight movies with a director. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's well, the goal. well, John, we're about to enter our final act in which we're going to be getting some of your top recommendations. But before we sure. do so, let's take a moment to thank our sponsors. When you're putting together that masterpiece movie, the coloring is a major creative decision. It can make the difference between whether the audience interprets your story as warm, cold, dark or light, and it can help define the genre of the film. Here's a quick tip. Horror movies tend to have blue tones, romantic comedies tend to have warm tones, apocalyptic movies tend to be grey and washed out, movies in which reality is off kilter tend to have green tones, and action movies tend to feature a lot of teal and orange, particularly in their artwork. The Emmy Award winning Da Vinci Resolve from Black Magic will help you get that perfect colour for your next production. The DaVinci Resolve 12 combines professional non-linear video editing with the world's most advanced color corrector. So you can now edit, color correct, finish and deliver all from one system. The DaVinci Resolve is completely scalable and resolution independent, so it can be used on set, in a small studio, or integrated into the largest Hollywood production pipeline. From creative editing and multi-camera television production to high-end finishing and color correction, only DaVinci Resolve features the creative tools, compatibility, speed, and legendary image quality that you need to manage your entire workflow, which is why it is the number one solution used on Hollywood feature films. John, welcome to the final act where you'll be showing incredible resources and mind-blowing answers. Are you ready? Sure. Um, John, if you could recommend a book for our listeners, um, maybe something that you have found helpful to your own uh, career as a filmmaker, what would it be and why? Very good question. Um, I, the one that jumps to mind, and it's not a, a music book, I have a wonderful book called The Four Agreements, mm -hmm. and this is sort of a book, and I don't know if anyone out there has heard about, about it, but it's written by a, a chap named Don Miguel Luis, I believe is okay. his name. Very well-known author, very well-known book, and it's really a book about you know living and 
there are these four agreements, which I'm not going to quote for you, but <laughs> they each are very, very simple and yet very difficult to to do. And I think that is a book that has helped me so greatly both in my personal life and in my professional life because mm-hmm. it obviously relates to your work, uh, your work and your life. So yeah. I would highly recommend that book. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, I'm looking forward to checking it out. It sounds like something that's going to be very uh, life affirming. Um, John, if you could recommend a movie to our listeners, um, maybe something that you have found to be a really great example of uh, music composition, what would that film be and why? Boy, there's so many. Uh, (laughs) I I anticipated you might ask me. It's always so hard to pick out just one, right? It's like being asked to choose your favorite child. It it really is. Um, You know, I, I will start by saying that really my two big giants in my life that have influenced me the great, the, the most have been uh, Jerry Goldsmith, God bless him, and John Williams. And so I love a, a lot of their scores. I would say, believe it or not, there are a couple of older Jerry Goldsmith scores that I just keep going back to. One is called A Patch of Blue, okay. which is a very kind of <laughs> obscure film, if you can even find it. Yeah, um, I can't say I've ever heard of it. <laughs> yeah, it's beautiful with Sidney Poitier and and it's just a lovely little score very melodic score Mm -hmm. I also love Jerry's uh, scores like um, I'll I'll tell you Total Recall is a great score Mm -hmm. of Jerry's I love things like Poltergeist Mm. Um, I'm just going to give you a few of them (laughs) we have John Williams where where, how how can you not quote 10 of them but I won't do it certainly Star Wars um you could sort of start and end with Star Wars, can't you? I mean, yes. Even, I even mean, that has to one. be one of the most iconic scores of all time. It is. really is. Other than but maybe that, Jaws or, I mean, it's. Yeah, Jaws, exactly. It's Jaws like any, and, any, pretty much any place on the face of the earth. If you start singing that song, even if you're in like <laughs> South Korea or in mm-hmm. Japan or in, you know, Ghana, people are going to actually know, even if you don't even speak the same language. So true. They're going to know they what are. that it's, movie it's is. A, there's a universality. Yeah. To it. You're right. But I love a lot of the, the newer scores, too. I love, I just watched Mad Max again the other night. I love Mad Max. Yeah. Um, Junkie XL is great. And so, you know, there's so many um, wonderful scores. But I, I would just invite listeners and, and composers that would be composers out there, new, new composers, just to listen to everything, mm. really. Um, John Barry comes to mind, you know, just all of those great masters that um, from the recent past and then the distant past. Yeah, yeah. Um, I would imagine, and this is just my guess because I'm not a composer, but I would imagine that there's a lot of tech that goes into um, very, many different various facets of your job. Um, yeah. And so I'm wondering whether there are any apps or websites that you would recommend to our audience. Well, you are so right. There are so many tools for com- composers and musicians mm-hmm. these days. I would say that I am the main use digital performer. So I'm, you know, there are different platforms for sequencing of music out there yeah but there's so many available now that um you know there are there are notation apps like sibelius and finale where where you can write music on a keyboard and then import it into these programs and then you can actually print out the music and you can manipulate it print out parts for musicians it's really i would say in the last 10 years certainly maybe even less than that there's been such a revolution mm. in, you know, both the sound quality of these samples that we use, of the, you know, the, the technology of being able to realize our scores now right out, right from a computer. Um, yeah. But there are plenty of them out there. I would just say that um, there are really too many to mention, but I use mm-hmm. a digital performer and I use the notation program Sibelius and finale and those are two really good ones fantastic well john it's time for the martini shot what parting piece of guidance do you want to share with us 
I think my biggest bit of advice is what we started with, Vanessa, and that yeah. is don't ever give up. If you have a dream and you really want to do music or you want to be an actor or you want to be a director, the biggest thing, the biggest hurdle I see is to not let yourself get, get frustrated, not let yourself give up. Um, if you're meant to do something and it's in your heart and you want to do it no matter what, meaning you do it for free, you, you yes, still want to do it. Yes, you'd pay to do it. <laughs> yeah, you'd even pay to do it. Exactly. Yeah. Then I think that that's a passion and that's a life passion. And I think um, the smartest people in the world sort of follow that, that dream. And by the way, it doesn't mean that a passion today is your passion tomorrow. I think mm. if something, if music isn't something that works out, then I would certainly find another passion. Yeah. But I think if it, I, I used to always say, and I say it often, that what I do is, is a blessed affliction. Yeah. <laughs> <It's>, you know, <laughs> I, 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 I so, that's, oh, I so get it. I so right? get it. Yes. Right? I mean, yes. we, don't have, we don't have a choice. Yes. It's those those of us that are given whatever this, this affliction is, we really don't have a choice. No. Whether we write or we direct or we act. And if that's what it is, then you just kind of, I think you have to honor it and just don't give up. Yeah. Just don't give up. Keep, Great keep advice. pressing on. You know? Great advice for Friday as well. <laughs> I think I needed that end of the week boost. Um, well, that's a wrap. Film Talk Nation in this industry, you're only as good as the people you know. And today you've been hanging out with John Debney and myself. If you want to go the extra mile, head over to filmtalkpodcast.com and type John Debney into the search bar. The show notes from today's show will appear along with everything we discuss, like John's recommended book and movie. John, we appreciate you sharing your priceless insight with us today. Day. Film Talk Nation thanks you and we'll see you on the red carpet. Thank you, Vanessa. See you soon. Thank you.